<laughs> no pressure. No, no bad <laughs> All right. All right. Here's one for the wildlife photographer who was just featured in the Smithsonian. Why do gorillas have such big nostrils, Lori? Uh, to smell us better with. I have no idea. Because they have really big <laughs> fingers. Oh, okay. Ah. <laughs> I didn't know that one. I know. It's the four-year-old in me coming out. Okay, so is anyone else excited about Lightroom 5 besides me? I am. I feel like I've been waiting for, for months. It's it's really crazy. I have not been waiting, but I went and looked at some of the features, and that one with the new clone tool just sent me quite happily along. Yeah, can I tell you how happy that makes me? Now I, I literally don't have to go into Photoshop like 20% of the time. Right. Because that was a big part of what I was using it for. I mean, when I'm doing simpler things, not really elaborate things. So let's everybody introduce themselves because this is going to be recorded and so everybody can make new friends. Just someone jump in. All right, Angela, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Angie from Chicago. Um, I've been using Lightroom for a long time. And uh, I'm excited about five, actually. I've, I've, I only just jumped to four because I had too many open projects uh, going on in three. But I'm excited to see what they've got in five. Love shooting. You know, I shoot a lot of weddings and... Uh, Commercial stuff, a little food, and uh, I just love them. Cool. Yay, Charles! And I'm coming out for the walk, and I'm excited. Hey. You're, wait, you're coming to New York? Yeah, I'm coming for the walk. I told you I have to do this. I can't wait. Wow, <laughs> this is going to be so good. I think I think New York might actually kick San Francisco's ass this year. Well, we'll I see. Think. We're I think trying. I'm just... Okay, can we uh, okay, Charles, who are you? Okay, um, and by the way, I do, if I am a little bit distracted, my daughter just got back from her college orientation, so I'm kind of trying to balance that and, and listen to this too. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm Charles Payette. Uh, I'm a dentist and serious hobbyist photographer in Charlotte, and uh, I've been using Lightroom since the original beta, and so kind of it's... Wait, Charles, can you can you just look right here? Hi. Right. <laughs> uh, let me get my. I don't think they have the uh, hangout drill quite yet, but uh, I'll, I'll ask. I'll put that request in. <laughs> okay, Diane. Hi, I'm Diane. I'm from Wilmington, Massachusetts, and I'm going to be on the New York Photo Walk also. Oh, great. Oh, yeah, yeah coming to it. Woo! <laughs> awesome. and I've been using Lightroom for about nine months, I guess, probably successfully about four or five months. I'm finally getting the hang of a lot of it. I still have a lot to learn about it, though, so okay. this would be a good chance to see what Lightroom 5 has to offer and maybe get some tips on four at the same time. Okay, cool. Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Elizabeth, and I'm located south of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm brand new to Lightroom. As of today, I just downloaded it. Um, I do know basic processing on it, watching other people and hanging out, so, but I'm excited about it and excited to start using it. Yay. <laughs> and a special guest star, Lori. Yes. That would be you. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lori Rubin. I work for Google and also Nick Software. Woo! And uh, Woo! yay! Yeah. And uh, I am a big fan of Alan's, so I love his work. And so uh, when he said he was doing a hangout today, I said, oh, I'll be there. So I'm excited to see what you do, Alan. Good to be here. Me too, because I'm like winging it. Bye. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and Pat? Uh, yeah, Pat Kite. I live in Albany, Oregon, which is a small town not too far from the ocean or the mountains. Um, I'm an old film shooter. Uh, came to DSLR about six years ago and um, am learning a lot from the Google Photo community. Um, I shoot for a marine science program here in Oregon. Oh, that's got to be fun. Do you go underwater or...? I don't go underwater, but I get to go out on the water a lot. I get to go out, out in fishing boats and stuff. That's way fun. Cool. Mm -hmm. So you just hang over the edge and, like, stick your yeah, camera? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, hmm. Okay. Patrick? Uh, I'm Patrick Kelly. Uh, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I uh, work at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. have a background in 
uh, digital image processing. Uh, photography is kind of a newer hobby. Last couple of years, really getting into it. Comfortable with Lightroom 4 and really looking forward to seeing what's in uh, Lightroom 5. Cool. Excellent. Well, let's, so let's jump in. Oh, and I'm, I'm Alan Shapiro. I'm an occasional photographer and uh, also an occasional advertising chief creative officer. And just a little bit of a shameless plug. Tomorrow night we are continuing a conversation I started with Smug Mug last week via a podcast. We're going to talk about how photographers can approach ad agency people and get their work seen and how they should be prepared and all that good stuff. So that's tomorrow night at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Ha, huh, okay. Goodbye. Time for a screen share. Okay, so now you can see yourselves, right? Yeah. Excellent. That's always fun. Uh, so let's see. So here we are in Lightroom, and I think everyone except maybe Elizabeth knows their way around, right? Um, and you'll see that the the interface is not very different from Lightroom 4 to Lightroom 5. In fact, it's not different at all that I've been able to figure out in the couple of months I've been beta testing and now playing officially with the new one. Uh, you still have your work in catalogs. You can still organize it the way you want as opposed to the way the catalogs want in collections. And um, all the metadata and tagging opportunities are good. There is a new module up here called the Map Module, which I'm not that familiar with yet, but I do want to point it out. I believe it lets you, you know, start to geotag your images. So here I found my house. Here I am in suburban Westchester, New York. And um, that's about all I got, but I know I can let people know where I'm taking photos, either with a uh, latitude, longitude, you know, geotagging and all that. So if anyone knows more than I do, that's great. But back to library, and actually we're going to spend most of our time in the develop module, and I did put together a little collection just so I could show examples that I thought made sense. Uh, starting with one of the features that everyone's been talking about, and I, I hope this isn't too redundant. I know there's been lots of uh, Adobe uh, little video clips on certain features. Uh, the National Association of Photoshop Professionals certainly does an incredible job, so do go visit their site, and if you're not a member, you should definitely join. Um, but it is the uh, alignment tool, and it's you'll notice over here I've got all my palettes and they're closed, um, and I can get rid of this, and you'll notice there's a little arrow over here so I can hide and, and minimize and maximize my screen. Another tab, but I don't want to do that just yet. I just want to hide one side. If you go down to lens correction, and if we talk in terms of workflow, this is the place I always start. And in fact, this becomes one of my batch processes. What I will do is I'll select all of my images, and I will enable profile corrections. And what that does is it looks at what at the data that my camera has transferred over with my pictures, and it says, Alan shot with this camera and this lens, and by the way, this lens has a certain profile, and so let's correct for that and make it perfect. So I will always click that, and you'll, in fact, if I click on and click off, if you look at this image, you just see this was, uh, what lens was this shot with? This image was shot with, where is it? Uh, with the 24105 zoom. So now when I go back into develop, it's going to acknowledge that and straighten it out a little bit. Okay, again, on and off. Here's what I really like. If you look down here, you have this new feature called upright. Uh, and it's got a number of settings. Right now it's off. I'm going to go through a couple of them. What it will do is it will level an image by clicking here. So again, I'm just going to go back and forth so you can see what's happening. It's looking Oops. Uh, it's looking for the horizon lines, and it's fixing it. Uh, it will also correct for vertical lines. Let's see what it does here. Did it do anything? Didn't look like it that much. Uh, oh, yes, it did. But then there's two over here. There's full, and there's auto. And again, what here, it's applying all of the changes you could possibly want. Back and forth, 
and you'll see it's doing a really good job of straightening the image. Now we can always do some of this beforehand by going into the into the crop tool and rotating things and then there are more uh, if I go into manual there are some of these other transformational tools that a lot of people probably don't even know exist but if you don't I mean it it allows you to correct for some lens aberrations if you don't have a tilt shift lens you can play around with it I find for me it becomes an interesting creative tool because now I can go into distort and I can start playing around with images now it's not appropriate on this one but you'd be surprised what sort of interesting creative effects you can get so that is the upright tool uh, if we go to auto Hmm, interesting that full and auto are doing two different things. I'm not sure what the difference is there, but do play around with it. Uh, if and in fact, let's go to this image, which is of the Freedom Tower. By the way, guys, can you still hear me? <laughs> no one yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You're good. You know, I'm a New Yorker and I kind of talk <laughs> fast. So if there's <laughs> anything that I'm going too quickly over, or if you have questions, just holler. Holla. Will do. <laughs> holla. Hala for Dala, kid. All right. So here we are, and this is the Freedom Tower. And I, I picked this image because it, there, nothing is straight in this in this shot at all. <laughs> and so I, I was just curious to see what would happen. And so here I'm clicking Auto. I'm, I think one of the things that I'm going to start doing now. Here you'll notice when I went into Full, it did a much more dramatic. Uh, looking at the verticals and the horizontals and it ended up cropping the image which is fine because if I choose to accept that you know I can always obviously just crop in and uh, and go from there I think I'm gonna go back to auto and it looks like it almost did the same thing so if I go off full auto it looks like it did everything full did but then it actually did the cropping for me so that's kind of interesting. That's all I'm going to do in terms of the upright uh, filter. Again, it's it's just a quicker and a slightly more intuitive way of doing the transformational tools that we've always had available. Moving on to the next big thing for me uh, is up here. And you'll notice we've got, Elizabeth, for you, there's a brush tool which lets you apply local adjustments this is the spot tool and we've all had it and we know that we can go in and we can I'm sorry the spot tools over here um, and they look a lot alike <laughs> they do you yeah. know it, it's always confusing to me I guess they want people to crop first and then spot and then whatever so we've always had this tool but it's always been uh, you know and you can make the brush bigger or smaller you haven't been able to change the feather. It is just what it is. It's been a, a slightly soft brush that lets you either clone or heal. Um, healing will obviously just have the program look around as you see what's happening here, and it will, it will patch it with what it thinks is the most appropriate. You can also move that around as you see I'm doing. So if you don't like what the, what the software chose, you can just grab that and move it around. I'm going to clone lets you do exactly that same thing on your own. So if I want to come up here and I, ooh, I'm sorry, I'm in the brush tool now. So you see what happened. That's the big news, by the way, the fact that, that it's not just a circular brush, that it now like an actual paint. could in in Photoshop so here I'm zooming in and you know what I don't really like how they've designed the radio tower so I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna and I'm doing it very messy normally I would be a lot more precise but I'm gonna just get rid of all that stuff up there because I think it should be clean and we're gonna or does um, now here it cloned and it did it did an okay job but it's still not great. Uh, but we can drag over here and maybe we'll be able to find something better. Here's the news for me. I mean, it is a great tool just to be able to, for instance, draw. If I don't like this line, by the way, see that it's going to hopefully get rid of that. 
Yeah, it did where I drew it. Cool. It's a pretty amazing. That, that's the only reason I still go into Photoshop. Right. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, it's, it's, you know, the content aware well, stuff, right? I mean. Totally. No. We've got that. Um, let's see. Cool. So when all was said and done, this image turned into. Alan. This. Yep. Can I ask a quick question? Um, with that, so is it no matter what shape you choose to heal or whatever, you have to actually drag it to where you want. It's not like the smart heal in Photoshop where it'll you know just kind of automatically select around it for you. The he heal will there's remember, there's two tools. Heal will make a good judgment call for you. So you'll here, let me let me go to a better image where there's like a clear spot. So I can you see right up here in the corner? Actually, let's do it down here. Uh, really like the seaweed in this shot. So I can, again, I'm going to go to heal, and I'm going to make sure that's active. And Lightroom, folks, if you're listening, it would be nice next time if you could make these a little bit more obviously different. Maybe it's me and I'm, my eyes are getting old, but it's hard for me to tell. Um, so what I will do now is I'm healing, and I'm just going to... We'll see what happens, and there we go. It did a really decent job. We would have to zoom in, and you know, once your eyes adjust to the fact that it there was just seaweed floating in the water, now it's totally gone. Um, if we were to do that same thing, let me get back, and I'm going to clone now. So now it's going to give me the option of dragging it to wherever I want to do it. Okay. So, so you see what differentiates. So there's there's really the difference. I mean they do the same thing. One is it tries to do it automatically in the heel and with clone it gives you the control. Okay. All right. Again you can always make your brushes bigger or using the left and the right bracket keys. I find that's an, inc uh, an incredibly uh, f yes. forgotten keyboard shortcut, uh, yeah, especially for people who are one. working with pressure sensitive tablets. Now there's another thing here that I have to point out because it also blows my mind is this, if you see right down here underneath in the tool, uh, right underneath the image, there's this thing called visualize spots and when you check it, it gives you what looks like an alpha channel. Oh. And there's also a slider so you can make it a little bit more uh, obvious or a little bit more subtle. Wow. But the nice thing for me is I, you know, sometimes when we're spotting our photos, you know, this was an older lens, so, you know, I think I know where all the dust is. <laughs> but also in a lighter image like this, if you look up here, you know, it, that I can now go in and I can get rid of, and honestly, I wouldn't have seen it up in there. Mm -hmm. Right? So now the other thing I want to do, because I'm here and this is open, let me see what my upright tool does. And look, it's straightened out the horizon, so thank you very much. <laughs> I can also spend a little bit more time in, in the healing the, the, uh, and get rid of some of these. I think these are oyster beds. This is Long Island Sound. Uh, and these are the... These are the areas that individual fishermen have sort of flagged out as their personal oyster bed. So we can go through and we can get rid of all those annoying lines and we can make this image perfect and, you know, there you go. Here's another quick one. I mean, this is another example of that visualize spots. I just, I like being redundant. Um, so here... Now you're gonna make us hungry, Alan. I'm sorry. You know, I'm working. I'm working on this this cookbook, and and you know, we just we were playing around. But so here we're shooting on white, and now look what starts to happen. Now you know, I'm kind of a perfectionist. Wow. And I, and I hate distractions. Wow. So even though we're on a white background, again, let me turn it on or off for you. You know, you never would see it. Right? In a screen, and I'm working on a 30-inch monitor, so I'm pretty big and bright, but I still would have missed a lot. And so this visualized spot wow. 
is incredibly valuable wow. for people who need to, you know, precisely and accurately get rid of any and all stuff, be it dust and smudges on their lens, or in this case, you know, surface artifacts that just showed up. That's cool. Right? So yeah. uh, there's that. Now we're going to go start having some fun. Uh, I was walking around, you know, people always ask me how I do my monochrome portraits, and um, I, my, the honest answer is probably about 20 different ways, depending on the situation. Now, a lot of them are, in fact, shot on black. I shoot on black velvet a lot um, with very controlled lighting. But, you know, I'm walking around New York or I'm walking around wherever, and occasionally I will meet some really interesting people, and I have no shame, and I will talk to anyone. So the other day, I, this was Saturday, and I, I met this guy, and he was walking, and, you know, he looked kind of glum, and I said, you look kind of glum. And he said, yeah, I feel kind of glum. And I said, well, can I take your picture? And so he immediately smiled. And I said, no, that's not what I want. Um, but so here he is. <coughs> this is going to let me just, I'm going to take you through an entire workflow now. So here's a basic portrait. And let's see what we can turn it into. Uh, most of you know about all the different presets that there are. Uh, I have a ton of them, and one of these days I'm going to get them organized and I'm going to offer them in various places. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start here, and the reason I'm starting here is because I want this darker, because I want to demonstrate this new spotlight tool. And so I just chose this preset because this is one of the, one of the, the ways I do it. And by the way, there's an interesting way of deconstructing it. So you can see that this, this preset uh, doesn't muck with the exposure. It does change the contrast. So here, if we zero it out, it goes all the way up to here. And it definitely takes my blacks down. Um, the clarity is fine, the vibrance I've taken down, and the saturation I've taken down. Now, I can play with it a little bit. Um, but you see, I'm not going all the way to black and white. That would be here. I'm leaving a little bit of subtle toning in here. I just happen to, to really like that for this particular portrait. Uh, and then we did some split toning. So for those of you who know or don't know, you've got this wonderful tool here that lets you choose colors via a color picker. So all I did is choose that. Or if I have a good idea of what the hues are, obviously we're going from red through orange to yellow. So just by simply moving this around, you can see that I'm changing the color I'm working with, and then I can change the saturation that I'm working with. So I'm a big believer in subtlety, except with my color flowers, where subtlety goes right out the window. Um, this is using sort of a, a very pale orangey brown. It actually looks like a tan and a slightly darker tan here. And one of the other things that people seem to forget, and I'm not sure um, why, but there's this balance tool in the middle. So now let me give you an extreme example. So if I wanted to do a true split tone, where I've got two very different colors, like warm and cool, and I'm just going to go all the way up with my saturation just to, to show you things. One of the things you can do is you can err on the side of the highlight color, in this case the orangey brown, or the shadow color, which is this lovely purple, or somewhere in between. So don't forget that you've got this balance tool in order to really fine tune <coughs> your... We're back to this, uh, and I think that's about it. <clears throat> and. Now let's get to the actual tool that I'm, that I'm so happy with, and it's the Spotlight tool. Uh, if we go here, so next to the Local Brush Adjustment tool, and I want you to notice here I'm, I've clicked on the Local Brush, and it, oops, and it keeps closing. <clears throat> and now I want to open it, because I want to show all of the different tools that are here at my disposal. So I don't know if you guys can see this in the, mm -hmm. in the Hangout, but there's a little arrow, and you know it will minimize or maximize each of the subcomponents within a module. I rarely, if ever, use a brush with just a single thing. So I may do a 
darkening of the exposure. I may want to soften the clarity, and I may want to take out sharpness. Uh, and in fact, I want to take the shadows down because I want to go all the way to black over here. So people ask me how I do it. You just saw it. I mean, you know, there it is in and out. And by the way, even though I've done that, here's the other thing. You've got two brushes that are available to you. And I set one pretty large with a nice big feather. And then I have a second brush that has a, you know, a lighter touch to it. And then there's an eraser tool. The other thing you can do is when you're in your brush tool, you don't have to click on this erase. I can be in my brush tool. And just by holding down the option key, <coughs> so there you go. Now, I showed you that for a reason, because every one of the components that you can affect, you can do here in the graduated tool, which isn't new. But now we've got this kind of, what should we call it? Like a, they call it a radial filter. I call it the spotlight tool. Mm -hmm. What it does is working from the middle, we can, oops, I want to zero all of that out. Um, and here what I want to do is I want to invert the mask. So let me do that again. So you've got this tool. I want to start with it inverted. And I want to click somewhere in the general vicinity of what I want to affect. And now I'm just dragging until I get to some place that I like. And now once I've done that, by the way, you'll see that I took my highlights way down and I took my shadows way up because it was kind of dark. So I want to open up the shadow areas. And I added a lot of clarity because this guy just needs clarity. And in fact, I may even take the sharpness down, uh, sharpness up. Now I can click anywhere on this and I can begin to start moving it around so I can finesse it and I can drag one of the side handles in or out. So it's giving me this incredible amount of localized control, just like I'm shining a flashlight. So I don't need to bring a light kit around with me if, you know, or I can recreate the light kit simply by, by doing this. Um, and the beauty of it is now I can do I can do as many as I want. So now I'm going to create a new one. So I've got to come back over here. I'm going to now open up the eyes a little bit. So now I'm dragging it over. And now if you notice, when I click outside of the, the ellipse that I created, you've got this curved arrow, which means you can rotate things. So now I can, I get, it's a very feathered brush. Look over here, I can feather the amount of it. And so now I have all of this wonderful control. Wow. That's fantastic. That is That's pretty awesome. Pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now I got to tell you, I mean, when I do my portraits, now let me get out of this. Uh, let me create new and we'll go back here so I can hide all that. By the way, uh, what did I just do? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> wow, what was that? Hang on, here we go. All right, we're back. Um, so let me go to like a reset. So I want you to I want you to see what's possible, and this is just using Lightroom. Uh, so here's the before. <laughs> and here's the after. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. Now uh, you know, Lori's here, and, and I, I have to give an absolute unshameless plug to the company that she works for, which is Nick, Nick Software, which is now part of Google. Um, their software suite, the Nick Collection, I mean, is, is sort of like my favorite tool in the universe. So I, I'm publicly going on record to say that the majority of my work, when I'm spending hours on portraits like this, is there because it gives me an incredible amount of control and tools that I'm just very familiar with. And I think I'll do a separate talk on that so I can, you know, share my workflow there because I just have so much fun in it. 
But here, the, the point of this, focusing on Lightroom, is with just, I mean, literally, if I weren't explaining myself, this, this portrait would have taken five minutes to process. Now, is it perfect yet? Absolutely not. But I want you to see the, the power and the, the ability that you have within this one program to play and experiment. And that's what I love you know, encouraging people to do. It's, you don't have to know what you're doing as long as over time you figure out what each of these sliders will do to an image. And this has been you know, years for me of just playing and experimenting and knowing that if I do one thing, it's going to do this. And then if I do another thing. Um, so here's kind of a, a, a quick portrait. Any questions? Anything you want to talk about? I just think the level of of localized control that they keep introducing into Lightroom is, as somebody was saying, just really reducing the need to go to Photoshop because that's, you know, so often what you do is just the selections, but that tool right there being able to just pick certain areas so much more precisely, that I mean, that's been right. a big key. Yeah, I mean, and it did it did a pretty amazing job, right? And yeah. now that's just... That's a mm -hmm. radial gradient, if you think about it in Photoshop terms. So, yeah. I mean, pretty awesome. Now, the, the thing I would probably do next is I would then go to my local brush. And again, I have the same exact controls. And now I might <coughs> play with, you know, do I want to open up some highlights somewhere in the shadows? Or do I want to pull out or soften some of the detail? So I can do that. So in, in the case of this, if I want to maybe take some of the clarity, you know, soften up down here with a... Again, I want you to look. My flow is at 100%. Most of the time, I do work on a graphics tablet, so it's set to pressure sensitive, but in this case, I'm just playing with my mouse. Um, I've got a maximum feather set, and the brush is set at, you know, the equivalent of, you know, 1920. Again, it's relative to the size of your image. And now I'm going to just go in and I'm going to, I'm going to just soften his shirt. Now I could go the other way too. And here's, you know, the beauty of it is once you've painted. So Elizabeth, this is more for you. You see what's happening? I mean, you know, you can, Oh yeah. you know, clarity is a edge contrast detection tool. Sharpness is the equivalent of ah. like, I guess, what would the equivalent be in your software at Laurie? Did I lose Laurie? She's muted. Or yes, she's... my muted button is off. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Get, repeat that once more. I'm sorry. So um, what would the equivalent of sharpness be in, like, Nick software? Well, we've got Sharpener Pro, and there's different variations of sharpness in there. Right. So, I mean, we've got structure that looks for um, contrast and actually kind of sharpens the edges a bit right. there. So maybe that's similar to clarity in a well, way. Well, here, help me, because this is something I always get confused yeah. on. What's the difference between clarity and structure? <laughs> Okay, well, structure is something that we have in all of our programs. And um, again, that's for the contrast, those fine lines and details right. and contrast, and that kind of pumps it up. And so from my understanding is clarity um, is not just the lines, but also maybe some of the finer details as well. Got it. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, let's do another image. Let's do, this is, this is my gardener. Her name's Ida. And, yeah. and I just and I took this and I just wanted to see what I could do to her because she's always making faces at me and she's got these great eyes. So I think in this case, I'm going to, again, let's see. Where should I start? Let's go. Is this boring anyone yet? No. No. Oh, good. So like always, I'm going to go down to lens corrections and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enable the profile correction. I think I was shooting with like a 100 millimeter macro. So it's got its own set of peculiarities, but you know, I was I was shooting in the backyard and she was puttering in the backyard. So we'll do that. I don't need to straighten it, but I do want to get rid of some of this this little bit of dirt that she's got on her face. That of course, as she's talking to me, I wasn't going to tell her it was there, but um, you know, it it bugged me a little bit. And then there's a little bit of you know distraction down here. So this is one of the things that I usually do. I've got a bit of OCD, and actually, it didn't do a Eh, it did an okay job, but I'm not sure I like that all. So we're just going to start over. 
there we go. That's a little better. By the way, one of the, the stupid little things that I found is rather than doing one big bit of, of cloning, unless it's attached, unless it's like a very long thread, which you should do in one fell swoop, I find that sometimes doing a couple of smaller passes works better. I'm not sure if that's anything scientific or if it's my own imagination. No, but I agree. Yeah. It seems to work better for me. Yeah. Um, let's do another thing because I just saw something that I want to see. And, yep, it's there. Um, I never would have seen a bit of dust right there on her chin. So, again, go into that visualized spot. So you see how all of these new tools are just making it so much easier to, you know, like work your way through an image. Now, so I did my lens correction. I closed that out. Um, now I'm going to go into my basics. And let's see. Do we want to do this in color or black and white, kids? Black and white. You want black and white. OK. Uh, hey, Alan. We, yeah. I'm just going to quit. So do you use the lens correction even on, I mean, pretty much on everything, including people? I've never even thought about doing that. I've always I've, used it just I've, for structures. Absolutely. I, I, find, I find that, you know, again, that what the algorithm that the, the folks at Adobe did is they know that certain lenses will distort an image a certain way, and so they've now corrected it. Again, is there a way you can set that up to automatically detect and, and correct on import? Uh, well, what I do is, uh, like I said earlier, I select all of my images. So here, let me do that. So I just, with a command A, I selected all of them. You can see they're all highlighted down here in the thumbnail. Um, and now I'm going to do enable profile corrections. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sync them. But now, so the synchronized setting comes up. And this is how you create presets, right? You know, right. You, can, you can do all this. But I don't want all these because I'm going to undo some of the, the stuff that I've done already. So I'm going to check none. And all I'm going to do now is go into process version and lens corrections. And now I'm going to synchronize. And, you know, sometimes I'll sit here and I'll stare at the thumbnails, and you'll see that now it is going through all of these images, and it's synchronizing them individually based on the lens that I used for it. Okay, that was going to be my next question, because let's say if you had a shoot where you used multiple lenses, you know, it, w it would automatically detect each one so you didn't you wouldn't have to go through a batch of say you know 500 images and pick all the ones that you took with your 70 to 200 which ones with I mean, it'll, I, it'll just pick all that up I believe so okay. I'm I may get hate mail tomorrow so please <laughs> understand I am I am not an approved Adobe technician I'm just a guy who loves processing photos so <laughs> don't hate me um, but now there's another thing you can do if you go into library. You know you can search by lens types, right? Right. Yep. So you could do that, and if you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. But I don't want to. My understanding is that I each of these images has its own EXIF data, and the and the the software is reading it individually. So in this set, I probably got five lenses represented among these ten or eleven images. Okay. Great. Thank you. So there you go. Okay, so we're going to go black and white with her. Let's. Um, I'm going to do this without any presets because I want to sort of talk more for Elizabeth's um, standpoint because I think you. she's the most <laughs> here. Um, as with Photoshop and as with most softwares, there's there's multiple ways of doing everything. So if we want to do a black and white conversion, the simplest thing, and Elizabeth, once you get familiar with, like I'm in the basic tab, by the way is there's this uh, slider called saturation, and I could take it all the way down. But that's really bad, because that's boring. Yeah, and that, I, I find that to be very boring when I've done that. <laughs> right. Um, there's also the black and white, and what that does is it gives you the ability to mix based on the color channels um, and much in much more detail than even uh, I find other programs allow me to do. But I don't know. I, you know, this is kind of fun. What I end up doing is I click over here. You see there's this little spot. Mm -hmm. um, when I click on it, what it's going to allow me to do is select it, and I'm dragging it into the image. And so if I remembered here, let me do something real quick. I'm going to make a virtual copy. And I'm going to set that back to whatever it was, to full color. Okay, so there's not really a ton of color in here. 
but for instance, I know in her face there is red, there's there's orange, there's yellow. So let's play around and see what starts to happen. So in this case, because it is very subtle, choosing this selection tool may or may not be successful for me. So if I click on the right area, you know, you see what's starting to happen. I'm going to nothing and I'm just going to play with the sliders overall. And again, her, you know, her hat, now I can darken down her hat or I can lighten it up and you see I'm making some pretty global changes by doing that. If you look at her eyes, she's got very milky green eyes. I think cataract surgery is not far away. So you see what starts to happen as we play with the sliders. And we could really make her look very otherworldly if we want, but that's that's really bad, right? So yeah. don't want to do that. that. Really yeah. don't want to do that. <clears throat> and giving her a mud mask there, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Um, so what I find I do is I invariably I take my blacks down. I'm going to leave her in color for the moment because I'm looking for a little bit more contrast. So for me, I like really rich blacks, and I like to open up the shadows. Here's another trick that I just learned in terms of setting white point, um, white and black point. Again, let me zero it out uh, and I'm going to reset it. Because some people just insist that you set your white and your black point. Um, so by holding the option key, so that would be the white or the black slider. Uh, is now going to be a very strong huh. than some other people might. By doing the same thing And now if we just did that as a before and an after, you'll see that there's a tonal range just by changing white and black points. Now I'm going to take the black down a little bit further. And notice, because we're talking about doing this in black and white, I'm not really going to worry about setting my white balance, although I could. But one of the things that's becoming very clear is the amount of red in her face. I mean, she was out in the sun, and she probably didn't put her hat on in time. So now we can go down here to HSL versus black and white, and we can sort of take the saturation of the red down, and we can do that you know, here globally. We can also, by tweaking our temperature and tint, we can do it on a local uh, basis. But again, don't want to do that because we're going to go to black and white with Ida. So... Let's see. Uh, I'm going to take the saturation. Actually, I'm going to do a different trick. I'm coming all the way down to camera calibration. And if you'll notice now, this is something that I, I can't even tell you the rhyme or reason. It's just something I've started playing with. Hey, Alan, um, hey, can, you, can you click on your little thumbnail on the left-hand corner there so there's a blue box around it, and that'll stay on your screen? Um, uh, right now, it's kind of jumping between people. There you go. Oh, sorry. I'm not Perfect. even... Did I do it? Yeah. Okay. Oops. Oh, no. You just lost it. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not liking what's going on here, so I'm just going to totally undo this. <laughs> and I'm going to go back to the handy dandy black and white tool uh, and I'm going to just play with my sliders a little bit so it's amazing how the sort of hate mail I get from people 
when I do this live because they say, oh my God, you made her look so ugly. And all I see is her looking at me with her beautiful milky green eyes. And I think she looks lovely. But, you know, so for those people, we can always, you know, sort of soften the wrinkles or we can make them a little bit more intense, you know, and, and celebrate her lines. Now, that, that begs a, uh, an interesting opportunity. If we go back to the new uh, clone and heal tool, one of the things I want you to also be aware of is there's now an opacity slider. So I'm going to show you something. If we, Ooh, click, nice. if we click on her laugh lines, and I'm being very horsey with it. So now, wait. I don't want to do that. I don't want to clone. I just want to heal. Let me undo that. That's the thing I always forget to click because it's not very obvious. So I'm going to do this, and it's going to take its best guess, and it's going to move down here, and it's going to kind of do away with her wrinkles, but let's say we don't want to do away with them altogether. Now by moving the slider, I've got a much subtler way of controlling how much or how little of a, of a lifeline I can remove. So there's another thing to, to be aware with as we now have this very powerful brush tool with the ability to affect opacity and the ability to paint in corrections. You know, this is a lot of what people do in Photoshop can now be done in Lightroom. Okay. But get rid of it because she likes her. <laughs> um, and that's that. Now, let's go in and we can play around. I've got, hmm, let me go. So now I'm zooming all the way in and I want to see what I can do. I can sharpen her eyes a little bit. So here I'm painting with a brush that has clarity and the saturation is up and the exposure is up a little bit. And I'm just bringing up the catch lights in our eyes a little bit. And if I wanted to, I could, you know, I could spend hours on specific features, you know, taking out individual hairs. But just for argument's sake, here she is. And if I think that's a little bit too harsh or a little bit too bright, I could take it down. Or I can make her glow in the dark and make her <laughs> evil. Ooh, alien. Which is the sort alien. of the equivalent of... You know, if, if my daughter were here, you know, I could, I could show you in real life how she does that. Uh, <laughs> but we have to rely on Lightroom and Photoshop and all that. So, uh, so here you go. And again, I, when I undid it, I forgot to take that little thing of dirt off her. And we've got this little thing here. So, <clears throat> so there's, oh, and we've got down here, but I'm going to crop it anyway. And then and start split toning. And, you know, we could have all sorts of fun with this. But there's just, uh, you know, again, we spent, what, 10, 15 minutes talking while doing this. And you can see the amazing amount of transformation. Here's before, here's after. And, you know, we could just keep going and going and going if I want to. So. God, there's so many great things that you can do. Yep. It's a subtlety. <laughs> Yep. Now, let's see. Let me do one more. Here's something. Um, I have no idea what the flowers in my garden are called, but I have a shitload of flowers in my garden. Um, so here's one. One of the things I like to do, it's a, it's a little bit of a trick. I go into the totem curve, and you know, looking at this histogram, it's pretty nice and, and balanced. And I could go and I could do that white point and black point trick. But one of the things, in fact, let me do that because I want to show you something. So, so there's that. And now I want to make a virtual copy because I want to show you an alternative way of doing it. And you can decide which you like better. Again, like I said, there's multiple ways of doing anything. So let me reset that. This is a little bit more cumbersome, but I find when I'm doing some of my more colorful flowers, what I will do is I'll come down into the tone curve. And usually it's set on RGB, but it also gives you control over the individual channels. So I'm going to click on the red. And what I'm doing is I'm grabbing the top corner of the curve 
and I'm sliding it and I'm watching the histogram. So you see I'm down here, but I'm looking over here up in the edge of the histogram and I'm looking for it just to turn to where I'm clipping the red and you'll see it turned red if you look at that top mm -hmm. triangle mm -hmm. and I'm going to back it off a little bit and I'm going to do the same thing. So that's the white point and I'm doing the same thing with the black point. You see how the triangle just turned sort of yep. red in the black point? So I'm going to back it off. I'm going to do that for each of the three channels. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oops. Now, sometimes you'll make a mistake and you'll drag in the curve, which <laughs> gives you a totally different level of control. Don't worry. We're not going to do that here. That's a whole other kind of lesson. Mm -hmm. But now, again, I'm just dragging the black point. You see the green channel is turning, so I'm going to back it off a little bit. And I'm going to go up to its the green white point and I'm going to come up here and back it off and with the blue channel you can see it's already blue so in this case instead of dragging in which makes it bluer I'm going to take it up a little bit and watch what happens you see again it's another thing that for me and I happen to be colorblind so I find it really hard to see the difference between the blue and the gray when it switches mm -hmm. so I know it just did but Lightroom, if you, if you want to do me a solid, can you make that like a slightly lighter blue or just more obvious? <laughs> uh, they owe me after screwing up my book in the book module. But now it's really perfect, so that's even better. So now here's that. And what I want to do is I want to go back and forth between the two. So this is just doing white and black point overall. And here's doing it channel specific. Now it's very wow. subtle but there's a difference, right? And what yeah. you can do is what I find is going and working with the individual channels gives me a little bit more control over the color cast in an image so I can shift it one way or another if I want. And, and I kind of like that. So now let's, let's not do that. Let's do that. So now I immediately took it to a black and white place. And you see all I did here is applied some split toning. Here's a secret formula. I'm going to close it down real quick. <laughs> and the Nutella and, formula? Is it the, um, yeah, I was going to say the chocolate or the Nutella formula? No, this is, this is the Dutch cocoa one. <laughs> oh, okay. Nutella's further down. They're, they're all coming out. They're all going to come out as, you know, <laughs> Maybe, I could, maybe I could talk Laurie into like doing a set for Nick or something. I don't know, but. Here we go. So now, so this is okay, but I want to see what I can do in the center. So I picked my targeted brush or because it's pretty circular, I'm going to go into that new tool. I'm going to pick the radial gradient. And what do I want to do? I'm going to increase my exposure. And we're going to start there and I'm just going to draw a little bit of a circle. Right. So look how nicely that just sort of, it lightened it up now if I wanted to try something different, now that I've got my mask there, and all this is is we've created a mask, if I want to open or close down my shadows, I can play with that, but I think exposure is going to work really well here, and I also want to push my highlights just a little bit more in that area. Now, now that I've done that, one of the things I realize is this doesn't give me as much control as the the local brush tool because I can't erase in this. Not that I'm aware of. I don't think there's an that. So there's a benefit to working with a local brush. I can do the exact same thing. You know, it starts circular. I guess if I wanted an oval shape, I could just draw it a little bit more, but I'm not going to. But now I can put down the correction I want, and then if I see So I want you all thinking about, you know, there's this radial gradient doesn't make it the ultimate tool for everything. Don't forget about the local brush. And again, here, I think I want to take my highlights down. So I'm going to create a new brush and I'm going to paint over in here. Did I do anything? I didn't. So I'm going to take those down a little bit. Um, and again, back to my new healing brush, which I adore because I've got this big stupid thing down here from another flower and rid of it. And 
go. It didn't. No, nope, it didn't go because I was Our on. Opacity is still down. Uh, is my opacity? Yeah, my opacity is down. You're absolutely right. So now I'm going to take my opacity up, and now look, it goes away. Cool. Right. Mm -hmm. So nice. wonderful. And then I could keep going and crop and do all that other good stuff that I would normally do. But you know, there's just the sense. So now enough of that. Let's go back out of screen sharing. And let's talk. Or we can just say goodbye. <laughs> they have questions. How do I get out of screen share? There we go. <laughs> Alan, I have a question. Do you use Photoshop anymore? Um, you know the layered work I do, Laurie? The the birds and yeah, I do. And depending on some of the portrait work I do, sometimes I'll use layer stacking in Photoshop. And yes, I know that you know there's another company that has a layers tool for Lightroom, but it's just not as intuitive for me. So I don't I don't really care for it. Um, there are there are lots of cases where Photoshop is part of my life. I, you know, as a designer, if I want to work with type and images, obviously. But I think this this release of Lightroom just for me it's a quantum leap. I mean, it really just the fact that I can I can clone out crap, not by placing polka dots all over my image, but by literally painting them out. The opacity tool combine the opacity slider combined with that gives you an incredible amount of, of uh, power right within Lightroom that you don't have to go to Photoshop for. Uh, I actually find that the clone tool is, maybe it's my imagination, it, it seems better in Lightroom than the equivalent version in Photoshop. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if I want to take a power line out or something, yeah. it just seems to do it better. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've been working with Photoshop for uh, probably 20, 22 years. How long has Photoshop been around? I mean, I was like an original beta tester. So I, it, it, for me, it's like I, you know, I could do it blindfolded. And, and the, the ability, the clone tool in Photoshop you know, has an incredible amount of power as well. The ability to you know, change the angle you know, so you can clone from a source and then rotate it or right. mirror it, etc. So there are things I can do like in minutes in Photoshop that I couldn't ever do in Lightroom. Mm. But this is a huge leap forward. And now with all the debate around the Creative Cloud and, and the subscription service and how expensive it's going to be, you know, I think this is, this is really one of those programs that I, I believe everyone should have who's working in photography coupled with like a Nick collection or an on one software. I really do believe that that, that will let people do quite a lot of work that a photographer needs to do. Of course, there are people who are very specialized, who are, who are just really uh, require that level of sophistication that Photoshop does, but not for the vast majority of us. So. Uh, hey, Alan, I just want to say thank you very much. I've got a good um, talk with my daughter. I said she was gone all day at uh, college orientation. So uh, I kind of felt bad that I haven't been able to really talk to her. So but I want to th say thank you very much, and uh, definitely look forward to trying this out. My pleasure. Yeah, have fun. I mean, just experiment and make make huge mistakes. That's, that's <laughs> cool. I'm good at that. I'm really good at that. <laughs> Take care, y'all. See ya. Bye. Take care. Yeah, I just um, bought the uh, the paid version of Five today and have not yet installed it on this computer. Uh, to so I'm going to be doing that in a minute here and uh, jumping in to play. Well worth it. And then when you find some more money, go buy the Nick collection. I already and, have. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> but but now here's what I want you to promise me. Here's what I want you to promise me, Pat. Um, as powerful as that particular suite is. I don't want it to become a crutch for you. I want you to really don't just rely on the presets they've created. Make your own recipes. Absolutely. It's so important that we find our own voices. Otherwise, all of us will start looking and doing the same work, and that's not, that's not fun. 
and it's not why we're here. We're here to inspire each other and to right. to play and to do different things, each of us, and learn from each other. And so taking what is a, a great tool and just using it to do one thing that they've told you to do isn't isn't right. True. Yeah, and it should be fun. Yeah. If it's not fun, find another mistakes. find another hobby. Make big yeah. mistakes, right? It's okay. Exactly. Yeah. Well, because you can undo all of them. That's the <laughs> thing about all yeah. I mean, you don't like it, trash it, and start totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what what I do, I you know, I talk a lot about creative sketching and in the context of photography. Now, I'm an art director by training, so I draw. I was drawing long before I was I was a photographer. Um, but I'll create like four or five virtual copies of an image. And then I will just, I will like in a minute each, I will sketch. I will play with the sliders and I'll do something high key and something very low key and, you know, play with contrast and, and, you know, just really then step back and look at all of the, the sketches I've done and then decide where I want to take it. What, because sometimes you have an absolute idea what an image wants to be when it, when it's done and you know that, and you can charge down that road. There are other times where it this is more therapeutic, and it, you can go down many paths. And I think that's the that's what's so relaxing about photography. When you're done shooting and you come home and you're all excited, is now to see that next phase. You know, you took the picture. That's fifty percent. Now this is the next fifty percent. If you're that sort of photographer, if you're a photojournalist and you're not allowed to touch anything, then it's just okay. Convert it to whatever <laughs> format the paper wants. Send it off. But we don't need that. We don't have that constraint. So this is where we become artists, and this is a great tool. I have a question I'm now. excited about it. It'll be, it's much better than the free stuff I've been working with. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But and, it, it has a lot of the similar things, the sliders and, wow. you know. And I knew about RBGH and the you know, yeah. The, I mean, one other thing that we didn't that, so. that we didn't really talk about because most of the people know about, but the file management ability within within photo within Lightroom, oh, the yeah. book module for me. I mean, I've got I've got now six books done through Lightroom. Now that they fixed the issue, thank you, Adobe. And by the way, they were really good at addressing it once I went public to however many. <laughs> But then they were really good about it, so that's okay. You know, they you learn from your mistakes. Um, the the ability to then create slideshows if you're presenting your work, either at an exhibition or if you're teaching. I mean, you know, every one of the modules is its own powerful tool, depending on the sort of photographer artist you are. Um, I, I could I could show you in ten minutes how to put a book together of an album of vacation photographs you took and export it to Blurb, another of my more favorite companies. Mm -hmm. And literally, you can do it in 10 minutes if you're not that you know, picky, but it will do it for you. And then you can sit back and be artist, but it does a lot of the work, and isn't that what software is supposed to do? It's, yeah. So, <laughs> Make it easier, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I find it indispensable, especially you know, the need to tag and track as I don't know about you but you know I'm not just on Google Plus I'm sharing I want to send images to my website I want to send images to the other couple of places where I showcase my work and the ability to not just export to within my catalog but now the export components that Lightroom has for Flickr for SmugMug for you know for Facebook God I think the only one they don't have is Google, which is weird, but maybe it's an API what thing. What is this about Google? We're not we're not on like any links. It's like there's very few websites that say and hook up with Google Plus. <laughs> Cuz we don't have to because all the cool kids know. This and, I try. And, <laughs> I, <we> <laughs> you know, I don't I really I, you know, I don't want my aunt finding me on Google Plus. You know, it's <laughs> Uh, well, I've tried to get friends and family members over to Google Plus. They won't come. So. You know, I'll I'll tell you what the what I think is the main difference. Facebook is really for your friends and family and sharing. Hey, this is what I have for dinner, or you know, something about the kids. But Google Plus is about your passion. So if you're passionate about photography or cooking, those are your you know circle of friends. So it's a little different dynamic. 
Oh, yeah. totally. It is. Yeah. It I is. mean, it's an it's it's not a social network. It's a networked community. And yeah. And I think you know it, whoever told me that the subtlety in those in that phrasing is really important given all the other tools that we have within Google. I mean, you know, so scheduling an event from my community, mm -hmm. having it show up on my calendar, letting me share docs among the members of my community because yeah. we're doing something together, you know? Yeah. Holy crap. I mean, that's amazing. And you can't do that. Have, have people show up in town that you've never met in real life, never even been in a hangout, and go on a photo walk with them. Right. You know? I mean, it's like, hey, I'm coming to your town. You want to hook up? <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's great. So, okay. So, any other questions? Otherwise, I, you know, want to be sensitive to people's time. I just... I like talking. No, and... thank you so much. It was great. I have, I have one quick question, Alan. Uh, yeah, I'm not in any hurry, by the way. I'm going to stay here <laughs> till whenever. So I'm, just, I'm not sure about the Nick. Is special? Is it Silver FX Pro, Pro, uh, Pro? That's the Nick. That's one. That's Pro. one of. I'll let Laurie talk about it because yeah, it's her baby. How that works with Lightroom and what the difference is between Lightroom and Photoshop? No, between Lightroom and the, the Nick effects. What you you'd buy that for oh. Lightroom, right? Yeah, it's actually a plugin that works into Lightroom, Aperture, and Photoshop. And so what we do is we offer presets and recipes. Alan was kind of referring to that um, as a way to get started in your image. But then we have a lot of custom sliders and drop-down menus. We have control points, which are very unique, where you can um, select a point and automatically mask out areas that are similar in texture and color and hue, saturation, etc. So we just make it really easy and friendly. And for those people that are... Uh, let's say Photoshop phobic. Uh, we're the solution. It's yeah. just so easy to use. The yeah. Two of them then. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. Yeah, I mean, uh, like Alan, he he works with Lightroom, but he also uses um, you know our plugins for specific recipes or things that he wants to put together. His special sauce, right? Per se, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, think about it. We all have. If we're all given the same ingredients in our kitchen, light. You know, Lightroom is one of those. For me, the Nick collection, and because I love black and white, the Nick Silver FX Pro 2 component is my favorite, you know, but then there's, they've got other things, other uh, programs, other modules rather, and all of those let you create different things in your kitchen. So what do you want to create? And, you know, if it were me, I mean, given given where Adobe's at and where I believe this group of people is, you know, it doesn't it doesn't go for everyone. But I think you could probably get everything you ever want to do done between Lightroom and like the Nick collection. That would be you know, there's a broad generalization, but I think if you just had those two pieces of software you would you would be happy for the rest of your lives. You never need to go to Photoshop. That doesn't mean that the other 100,000 people do need Photoshop or the 10 million people. Of course they do. They're doing different things. Right. So. Okay, we'll have to look into it then. But yeah, and you know, there's trials for both of them. So if money's an issue, at least you can play around with it a little bit and see what you like and what you don't like. And then I'll have to have you, Alan, come on and uh, do a little demonstration on Nick. I'd like that. Mm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, Espe especially for the black and white conversion because, mm -hmm. I mean, I know a lot of people that do black and white that I follow that, you know, love it, live by it, so. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Definitely. Okay. Any other questions or? Just like to thank you for your time, Alan. Really appreciate oh. you doing this. Uh, it's my pleasure. That was really <laughs> See you I want to teach day. when I grow up, so, you know, this is practice. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone... Patrick, we'll see you on the 29th, because yeah, I've got to go to Bella wants to go out. So we will see you the morning of the 29th. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll see you then. All right. I'm going to go take Bella for a walk. Hi, everyone. I'm, staying on, I'm yeah. staying on. I'm going to open it up public. So. Okay. okay. i got to go. All Bye. right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Angie, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Alan? I'm great. I can't believe you're coming out. That's so exciting. I'm so excited. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny is um, I made my plans over the weekend. Uh, two weekends ago, um, we have some friends that moved to New York recently, and um, I was gonna come out with a friend. The friend dropped off, and uh, I was gonna come anyway. 
but I was like, ah, I don't know where I'm going to stay. Okay. We're like, come stay with us, and he's going to come. He's going to come join me at least for a while. So cool. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to. It. And that was before um, the you know smug mug thing. So. Oh well, it's going to get even better. I don't. I guess we're still. I, you know what? Let me do this. Um, I'm going to end the hangout on air, okay. and then I'm going to start a new one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Diane, do you want? Sure, I'll come here for a couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll just send an invite, then I'm going to open it public. But but there's there's other stuff going on at our at our photo walk that I can't announce yet, but it's killing me. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to. <laughs> All right. So just stand by for another invitation. Okay, guys. Okay. okay cool. Okay. Bye.